So I'm uh, very glad to welcome you all to another advanced team conversation, this time about uh, China and green finance. We have two leading experts in Charles and Christoph to be moderated by John Lillywhite. Handing over to you, John. Hi, everybody. And Oscar, thanks for that introduction. Um, Dr. Christoph and Professor Charles, thanks so much for joining us today. So, you know, jumping right in, I thought we'd begin with a short introduction to both of you and then talk a little bit about the general themes, some of the general issues uh, and sectors you're both working in, and then kind of deep dive into some of the poli policy discussions and challenges and opportunities you both work with on a daily basis. So, Dr. Christoph, starting with you, um, you are the founding director of the Green Belt and Road Initiative, a Green BRI Center at the International Institute of Green Finance. So what is that? Right. So what we're doing at the Green BRI Center is looking at how we can accelerate greening of investments uh, in the Belt and Road Initiative. So pretty much all Chinese overseas investments and how can we ensure that there are um, conscious of environmental impacts and reducing negative environmental impacts while, of course, accelerating the economic development goals. So we're working with a number of different stakeholders in China on the regulatory side, on the financial and sector side, but of course, also with a lot of the um, developers themselves, so state-owned enterprises and private enterprises, as well as, of course, with the um, necessary or uh, large BRI countries that are receiving a lot of the Chinese investments and international partners in the European Union and the US. So you also, you also speak Chinese, is that correct? How, what, what was your kind of career path into this job and why did it appeal to you? As long as you don't ask me to speak Chinese here, I can, of course, say that my oh, Chinese is... That was the next question, is, but, but anyway. It's, it's, it's fair <laughs> enough. Uh, I, I can get by, um, but uh, speaking Chinese is an ongoing challenge for anybody who has to try to study Chinese. I think it's very well aware of. Um, so I very much admire the um, people who have studied Chinese and can really uh, fluently converse in Chinese. Um, so my career path is... Uh, I've done, actually, over the last years, um, a number of different things. I've been with the World Bank for quite some time, um, working um, in a number of different markets with the World Bank on the advisory side. Uh, I was a couple of years at Harvard um, and then came from there uh, to China about four years ago to constantly uh, work here for the last uh, four years. Okay, well, thanks for that introduction. So, okay, um, Professor Charles, Chang. You are the Deputy Dean of Academics, Professor of Finance, Director of the FinTech Research Center at Fan Hai International School of Finance, and a member of the finance faculty at the Chinese Eastern University of Hong Kong. So could you introduce yourself a little bit, as well as possibly very quickly, just telling us a little bit about Fan Hai International School of Finance, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and of course, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. No, absolutely. So um, so my name is Charles Chang. Um, I came out to China a bit before Chris. I came out in um, 09 um, from Cornell, uh, where I was on the finance faculty uh, for six years, um, and then came out here. And at that time, really, um, sort of at the beginning, actually, of the, the so-called new modernization of Chinese university education. Um, and uh, was very fortunate to uh, join another school here in Shanghai, um, one of the, uh, also one of the best uh, finance schools out here, a school called Shanghai Advanced Institute of Finance, um, where I had the opportunity to meet Chris some many years ago. Um, and then in 2017, uh, we founded the Fanhai uh, International School of Finance. Uh, again, very, very fortunate to receive what was at that time the largest single donation um, by a Fudan alumnus uh, to, to start this school with the express goal of um, establishing a global first rate uh, finance program, um, both in terms of the educational offering um, and of course, in terms of the research. Um, and so what we do here in, in that regard, in that aspect is uh, both academic research, um, my space being FinTech, um, and in applied and poli uh, policy research. And that's something that um, has been very important to us since our founding. Um, and was really one of the stated goals of both our donor and of our university um, when we started this all. And that is to have and to provide 
a, a global perspective um, and potentially global leadership um, in, uh, in our research, uh, particularly in my case in, in FinTech and in policy. Um, and, and so, you know, quite a lot of what we do here is to look at things like Belt and Road um, being, you know, a primary outreach initiative on the part of the Chinese government um, to have a positive and sustained impact um, on the region um, and to figure out, you know, how to do that right. And uh, as uh, Dr. Nelpo uh, pointed out, how to do that in a sustainable way um, and how to do that in a sort of win-win for uh, the economies, um, for the people, and, and of course, for the environment as well. So, so those are, are, are the types of things that we do here. And uh, I want to thank you guys for, for uh, inviting us and having the opportunity to speak with you guys today. Yeah, so thanks for that introduction. And we'll get to the, to the BRI in a minute. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are already familiar with it. Um, but I think both of you are approaching it from, from a perspective that's a little bit unique. Um, but just as a very quick aside, so in 2005, I was at law school with a lot of students from um, Hong Kong and mainland China who would later go back to kind of, you know, join uh, the ju ju judiciary or policymakers in Beijing. And that was 2005. And um, a lot of them would talk about universities in China and how they were trying to globalize. How, what's your perspective on how the kind of Chinese university system as a vector of globalization has shifted over the past you know, five to 10 to 15 years um, as a quick aside, because I think it is interesting. No, I, I think there's been a lot of gains. Um, I think, uh, first of all, of course, is bringing the talent. Okay, and I think that had been a real issue, right? Right. Uh, just in terms right. of you know, pay scales and benefits mm. and all these sort of things. Of course, of course, you know, the intellectual um, uh, property aspects and, 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 and so forth. Um, and I think a great many strides have been done there. I'm a US citizen, I was born in Boston. Um, so, you know, I am not a, a Chinese national, have never been. Um, so uh, the vast majority of our faculty here at Fanghai, uh, likewise, um, all of them uh, studied and got their PhDs abroad. Many of them taught abroad for a number of years. Many of them are, are not, um, I should say most of them are not Chinese citizens. Um, and so I think that's the one was to bring the talent. Um, I mean, you can, you can hardly expect to deliver a top grade education without having top grade faculty. Um, and then of course, uh, the additional outreaches, right? With the partnerships, joint degrees, uh, as you may know, you know, NYU has a campus here um, in Shanghai, really? you know, 20 minutes walking home. Um, so, so absolutely. So there's been incredible outreach in the last 10 or 15 years. Yeah, because I mean, historically, that's been a very big problem in this part of the world. So not so much in the UAE, but in the Levant, you have kind of massive drain, brain drain of, of the best and you know, the brightest students going abroad to foreign universities when they can, getting great qualifications, great experience, the problem being they often don't come back. Um, and, and I think that's, that's slowly, possibly, hopefully just starting to change um, and have an impact, particularly in the UAE actually. Okay, so Moving on to quickly introduce um, the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, I'm sure you both get bored about, you know, um, explaining what the BRI is, and we won't have to go into it in too much detail. But I guess the main point is this is a truly humongous project. Um, in 2013, uh, Yi Jinping um, announced the investment program. And um, according to a talk I listened to you by you, Dr. Christoph. Um, the, the total worth of the BRI is more than World Bank, IDP, AFTP, ADP, um, and several other funds combined. So, so the point is, this is a massive undertaking, and it's a global undertaking. That's correct. So um, I think you, you covered some of the main uh, issues of the Belt and Road Initiative. So it was announced in 2013. It consists of the land uh, corridor and the sea corridor. So there are two main um, uh, silk roads that you uh, that are um, under consideration. There's interestingly um, some confusion uh, that we can uh, um, discuss about here in this uh, podcast as well. There are two different definitions of actually who is a member of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, mm -hmm. So the uh, there's a definition which is the countries along the Belt and Road Initiative. That is mostly 64 countries that span from China all the way to Europe. 
and touches a little bit uh, the African continent with Egypt being part of it. That's one definition that is uh, officially used. I like the other definition more of countries that have signed um, memorandums of understanding with China to join the Belt and Road Initiative or to cooperate under the framework of the Belt and Road Initiative. Now that's of course um, much more explicit where countries actively decide to become part of this uh, framework. And it's not only about investments, it is about much broader um, cooperation. So facility connectivity, um, more seamless financial transactions, mm. um, also people to people exchanges. So there are the five pillars of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, it is much broader than just um, uh, investments. And it's of course, um, the goal is often depicted as a present of uh, China to uh, the Belt and Road countries and ideally to the world and how, that it's very, very open. Um, of course, it's a Chinese uh, initiative. And of course, China has um, some both economic uh, ambitions with the Belt and Road Initiative, for example, to improve trade relations with the Belt and Road Initiative countries. Um, it also has, when it does investments, of course, has financial interests when it does uh, these investments. Um, and it, of course, also has policy goals um, to strengthen political relationships uh, with, with a number of these countries. Um, and what we're also seeing is uh, particularly over the last year when we analyzed the, um, uh, the Belt and Road investments um, that indeed uh, the slowdown of investments, of course, we, we saw in 2020 due to COVID a, uh, um, a significant slowdown of investment activities in the Belt and Road Initiative, that the countries that are, uh, however, members or kind of signatories of the Belt and Road Initiative um, saw a um, slower decrease of investments compared to non-BRI countries. So there's um, the uh, decrease of investments was less so in BRI countries than in non-BRI countries. So it seems to have some benefits um, for, for these countries to receive Chinese investments um, also in the crisis situation. Uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, I like the way you referred to it as a framework and it's not just geopolitical, it's, um, you know, um, financial, it increasingly, um, I think, involves digital, and it also involves other aspects such as shared laws or, or shares, uh, shared even technological protocols. But I think approaching it from the perspective of green finance and, and, and financial instruments is something that I haven't actually read that much about and, and we need to jump into. I think another point that, that I've had mentioned by you and others before is that there's also a historical role to this. You've got the, the idea of the old Silk Road, which worked in the past and of course played a major role in, in the history and evolution of the Middle East. Um, I've also got some numbers here um, up to 700 billion between 2013 to 2019. Um, so we're talking about some serious investment and, and a serious kind of long-term um, project. So I think now we've introduced the BRI, what might be inter interesting as well is also talking a little bit about China on the global stage, why China would begin a project like this, but most specifically, why the green economy is important for China. So I wondered if either of you wanted to kind of jump in on that and kind of give us a bit of background on the Chinese economy, its global ambitions, but also in particular, the, the role of green finance and the green economy. So I'm definitely happy to talk about um, these these topics, and I also kind of, uh, of course, uh, am happy to uh, learn more about with with Charles together. Also, how digital finance can, of course, play a, a big role in in supporting a lot of these ambitions. So the official. Uh, languages that green has always been part of the Belt and Road Initiative. And since its inception, uh, green was uh, was included in the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, when we look at the investments, of course, there is um, still a lot of um, room to improve uh, the greenness of the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, what do we understand as a green um, and kind of green investments and therefore green finance is, of course, um, a lot of the BRI projects uh, the bulk of the investments and bulk of the activities are in infrastructure investments or so transport and energy um, investments. And there it's um, relatively clear um, for quite a while for the uh, um, 
overall international community what is green and what is not green. In December 2020, um, China or the relevant authorities in China backed a uh, study or a guidance, which is called the BRI Green Development Guidance. It has a traffic light system um, for BRI projects. I was part of the study um, and developed this uh, traffic line system, how to evaluate projects in terms of their, their greenness. And that for the first time um, really um, provided a taxonomy, which projects are green, which projects are not green, and particularly also for the transport and energy infrastructure. So of course, solar and wind um, investments in energy would be considered green. Um, yeah. Fossil fuels would not be considered um, green, but would be considered red, so non-encouraged projects. And similar in transport, Public transport, of course, green. Um, road transport um, uh, with some with some question marks, potentially even red, due to the impacts on biodiversity. So there's, for the first time, kind of a much stronger um, framework. How do we actually understand and conceptualize um, green finance to put it really into practice, rather than just saying we want to have a green BRI without really defining it? Mm -hmm. So this is, um, in the, in that case, really a landmark. Um, uh, uh, publication that was backed by relevant uh, ministries and authorities um, in, in China. And th this is kind of what then um, also provides the opportunity for uh, both developers and financial institutions, because what we are looking at um, from a financial perspective is, of course, risk and opportunities. Qu quite simply, um, an investor, uh, 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 kind of really kind of pure investor cares about um, financial returns. And what's really um, interesting is that um, due to climate change, we're seeing a shift in how we have to evaluate um, risks, um, how we evaluate the physical risks of extreme weathers, how we evaluate the transition risks, for example, of new laws, um, how we evaluate the transition um, risk of new technologies. And what's really, really promising is uh, the massive decrease of the cost of uh, solar and wind. Um, and that has provided, of course, a much higher return often on investments in um, wind and solar because the cost of generating electricity with uh, uh, wind, wind, and, uh, wind and solar have decreased, whereas the cost of generating electricity with coal and any type of fossil fuel has actually not um, decreased but has been stable, if not increasing due to um, potential um, carbon, uh, carbon taxes and, and carbon prices. So for, from an investor perspective, then it does not make sense anymore to invest in these fossil fuels because it becomes just a stranded and dead asset. Um, and so this is what, what, we're, what we're trying to um, really understand and also try to include those considerations into the financial decision-making and um, also supporting the relevant regulators to really conceptualize how do we evaluate brown risks and green opportunities um, in, in the financial sector and in our investment decisions. Okay, that's super interesting. I mean, we, we, we should go into the investment aspect next. But just before we move on to that, there seem to be kind of two general themes here. One, you kind of had the, the traditional ethical um, Western kind of discussion on, on climate change and, and, you know, moving the economy green. But on another level behind that, you also have this understanding that a lot of these technologies uh, in terms of renewable energy, uh, in terms of automation and, and a cleaner environment will be a component of the fourth industrial revolution. So it's not just, um, you know, about moral or ethical systems or, or reducing the carbon footprint of China and the Green Belt and Road Initiative. But there's also an element of, of technological um, competition and, and disruption in some of these new, new technologies that are being pushed to market. And I think that's a very that's important because it's also an element of incentive, right? It's an incentive for investors, and it's also presumably incentive for China as a whole. So I wondered if if Charles, you wanted to speak to that a little bit. Yeah. So really, it's it's layered, right? Um, I, I think first, when we think about what China is trying to do, okay, and um, you know, to, to to answer your very very first question. I think China, in a word, is looking to be, uh, you know, to be part of the leadership. Okay, and what I mean by leadership is in in all the different levels. Okay, um, be it financial, political, environmental, and so on and so forth. So, when we think about, you know, what's China trying to achieve in a in a macro sense, I think that's what we're we're talking about. 
right? And that's reduced um, bilateral dependence um, on, on any particular region or country. Um, that's about fully sustainable development of its own, um, including the green, but the sustainable development of the country itself in terms of its domestic market, in terms of its wage levels and income levels, um, in terms of eradicating poverty, in terms of financial inclusion. You know, all of these things are mission critical for China to be itself um, sustainable going forward, right? And so when we think about then the Belt and Road countries, and so I'll be very specific, not, not, ju not the just the initiative itself, but the countries along the Belt and Road. Um, you know, you're talking about anywhere between 40 and 50% of global GDP. You're talking about well upwards of 60% of the world's population. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, most of the estimates we see in terms of infrastructure alone, you're talking about two to three trillion US dollars of investment. So it's all of those things, right? And that's market, that's um, development area, that's, in, that's also um, regional stability. And I think that's something to really keep in mind. You know, when I started to learn about the Belt and Road Initiative and, and talking with senior officials and so forth, the, you know, the, strangely, the term that came to my mind um, is ecosystem. It's about, God, I, 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 I'm going to sound way over romantic on this, but it's about a joint destiny, right? It's about saying, look, we're going to grow as a region together. China is a machinery that generates all sorts of opportunity, all sorts of markets. Um, you know, take your product, multiply it by 1.5 billion, what do you get, right? And we can be an engine for development for the region and for the Belt and Road uh, countries. And how do we intertwine, right? How do we build this into an ecosystem? So to give you an example uh, in terms of green, right? So nobody does hydroelectric like China does. And you don't have to spend much time at the Three Gorges Dam uh, to see that. Um, and that's something we've become good at. We, we know how to build dams. We know how to do hydro. Um, there are many, many countries along the Belt and Road that are housed within mountainous regions um, that have great elevation drop and, and, and uh, water mass to come through and turn turbines. Um, and then the question becomes, well, the, how can we do that, right? How can we be part of that development both from the perspective of the knowledge transfer, um, bearing in mind that we're not gonna run these power plants, right? We're, we're going to help you build them and develop the tech for yourself. Um, but that's about sustainability within your own, your, your own country. And then like, uh, as Christoph pointed out, how are we gonna finance this thing? And that's where I think a lot of the innovation in the finance area that China's trying to do now is going to play that role. Right. So, for example, when we talk about things like, you know, the, the CBDC and the opportunities to do direct RMB digital investment in Belt and Road countries. Now we're talking about, you know, offering financing almost instantaneously, um, you know, reducing the reliance on U.S. dollar, um, offering an additional uh, financing tool for SMEs and so on and so forth. Beyond that, as we talk about, you know, blockchain technologies that are being developed here in China, now you're talking about opportunities to do um, fractionalizations and securitizations of large scale infrastructure projects where the local economy is included in the financing um, and the development of these green technologies. So it's no longer about China drumming up investment for a hydroelectric plant in, in country A. It's about how can we chop this up into small enough pieces where the local economy, which is the beneficiary of the green technology, how do we get them to be able um, to engage um, in, in, in that, that financing task and in that development? Okay. Mm. That, makes, that makes sense. So the kind of connection between emerging um, innovations in finance and emerging technologies that are coming to market in green technology. Uh, what you're saying is there's a strategic 
um, reason for the two to come together. And so for background, I mean, mobile payments are 70% of GDP in China versus 6% in the USA. I think that's becoming um, an increasingly major conversation, both in the United States and in Europe. And you've also had a story recently on China creating its own digital currency, the cyber yuan. And um, I think you, you referenced a bit of, of, of the, the role of blockchain and some of these new financial instru instruments in making China, as you said, more independent and, and more of a player at the table globally. Um, but I guess, you know, just on, on a very basic level then, what synergies do you both see? Because you've clearly spotted some opportunities here or, or some very interesting shifts in how the world is working between the evolution of fintech and the financial markets, specifically in China, and China's ambitions for the BRI. Well, Charles, I mean, you should go. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'll just talk quickly about one example, right? And, and that's been super hot lately is this, uh, is this green bonds market. Right. Mm. Um, and these green bonds are now becoming a, a very popular financing tool. Uh, you know, depending on who, who you ask, it's upwards of, say, 500 billion US dollars uh, level of market. Um, and then the question is, you know, how do we let this develop more? Now, China has been a major uh, player in this space. But as, as Christoph pointed out, I think very, very astutely and precisely, the question is usage of funds. Right, um, you can claim that you're raising this money to do whatever you like, right? In the end, it's about uh, where did you actually use it? How is this being audited and, and, and or monitored, right? And then how are redemptions done to the investors? So along this particular you know, aspect, you know, the use of proceeds, the tracking of that, um, one tech that we've been working on here in the, uh, in the FinTech Research Center is how to engage blockchain in the design of green bonds. And mm. in doing so, allowing now and enabling more than just sovereigns or pseudo sovereigns to, to, to play in this green bond area, but to allow corporations um, and uh, uh, you know, other regional or even local public entities to say, look, we know we don't have the credit of a sovereign entity, we're not gonna argue that. What we're gonna say is we're gonna be ultra transparent. We're going to track everything. We're gonna distribute a ledger. Uh, we're gonna right. share all this information with our investors. On top of that, we're going to do you know, smart contract um, regulated and governed um, payments um, and distributions. Involved with that then, you can have all sorts of monitoring plays. So for example, Let's say you committed um, with, in accordance to uh, 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 international standards, let's say you committed 95% of my proceeds will go towards a green technology. But instead, as the ledger then will show and every expenditure of dollar is tracked, turns out you only did 85%. Now the smart contract goes into play and says, okay, well, you were paying a 5% coupon you're, start, you're going to pay a 7% coupon now. And that doesn't have to be monitored by anybody. That doesn't have to be signed right. upon a new contract. That doesn't have to be mm. renegotiation. That's straight in the smart contract, automatically kicks in at, at appropriate intervals. And now there's a real penalty, right? There's a real penalty to the issuer to say, hey, it's not just some, some, some standard I'm supposed to follow. In fact, it's going to be linked directly to the cost of servicing this debt to me. And by applying that blockchain technology, and you know, I'm sure we all know uh, how those things work. Basically, number one, everybody's gonna see the ledger all at the same time, yeah. including regulatory bodies. Mm -hmm. And then with the smart contract technology, we're going to implement whatever enforcement details that need to be set in. Um, straight away and these are things that then are set up at the in you know at the creation at the genesis stage so that every investor will know hey these are rules of the game if they don't follow these rules these will be the things that are going to happen these are going to be you know my remunerations the, you know the ways that i'm going to uh, to to be able to um you know get back whatever is coming to me in terms of me wanting to support green initiatives and maybe you not doing it in such a scrupulous way right so 
So I think that's just one example of how these green initiatives and the technology, the finance technology may be coming together for the benefit of both, right? And, and once we lower the risk of green bonds, once we can show that, um, you know, that they're really gonna be used for uh, green initiatives in an enforceable way, maybe that makes them more attractive to investors. Right. You know, builds the right. market for everyone. Yeah, so there's some real innovation, real world innovation happening there. I mean, it's not just policy, but I guess a question for you both, particularly Dr. Christoph, is how do you invest stakeholders in this process because it's new? And is that about writing policy? Is that about bringing people together? Is that about regulation? Particularly as you're looking for investment, you know, and you're looking for, for people to, to support this um, with financial backing. How is that process going? Is it an uphill journey or are you beginning to get momentum you're beginning to bring stakeholders on board people are be beginning to understand what you're trying to do and also is that process restricted to to china or is it easier to bring people on board there or are you really having a discussion that is you know multipolar in different countries that's a that's a great question and uh, i think how to bring people on board is always by providing them a benefit yes. and who's, who's having the benefit if it's the investor um, they will drive it if it's a policymaker because it's a public good goal of course the policymaker has a role i want to kind of also add some more um, examples to to charles um, and how we actually see the use of um, uh, digital technology and digital finance um, to drive uh, particularly also greening of uh, investments, not only in the BRI. And uh, I think that's, that's, a, that's a more broader um, aspect. The core of um, blockchain technology is of course, the uh, kind of that you, it's not uh, alterable. That's kind of um, not yeah, kind of without, out. It's not without broader consent. So you can't tinker with it. Um, and I think that's in many ways, the main advantage. Many other things can be done actually in a much cheaper way because in the end, uh, blockchain technologies require massive amounts of energy. It's not that blockchain technologies are actually in, in per se green. Blockchain technologies per se are actually quite um, energy true. intense. That's quite a right. Um, yeah. it's, it's, it's absolutely, um, so it should be used for what it can be used and for where it actually brings a value at. It does not bring a value at actually to most of the things that um, uh, blockchain um, enthusiasts are necessarily talking about. This can be done with a simple database um, and we don't need this massive distributed ledger um, with so much computing power. Just to give you um, related to blockchain, um, but uh, China itself is responsible for about 70% of the um, Bitcoin operations worldwide. Right. Yeah. Um, and there was a, a paper in Nature just published uh, uh, this year in 2021 that by 2024, um, the uh, blockchain operations and particularly Bitcoin operations of China will just the emission, carbon emissions from the Bitcoin operations will be equal um, to the um, uh, carbon emissions of the Czech Republic and Qatar combined. So we have to put, we have to wow. really um, make sure that not changing one, uh, one kind of dream mm. for actually a clearly um, uh, ener energy intense uh, uh, technology. So where is this unalterability actually useful? Um, one of the important aspects that we're talking about in green finance is the provenance of products. It has to do with biodiversity protection. It has to do also with climate protection. So if we want to um, say we want to um, ensure that if the wood, the timber that we're using is not coming from any protected areas, that the fish that we're using is actually not harvested or fished in protected waters. That's when um, blockchain technology, because it's unalterable, is really important. Mm -hmm. So we don't falsify our documents. Another aspect is electricity. Where, do actually, where does actually electricity come from? If you are a um, conscious uh, car company that says, we want to be actually a green car company, we have NEVs, and it does not make sense to um, get the electricity for our NEVs from any of the coal-fired power plants, but we want actually to have a green mobility. Therefore, we have to ensure that our electricity comes from a green source. This can be done with blockchain. You don't want uh, any alterability. Other things is carbon offsetting. This is a huge topic. How do we actually offset um, carbon that we are creating and that we are, will create for the, for the foreseeable future? How can we make sure that the carbon offset that we're buying is actually used in in 
a real way. And it's not mm. W, so we don't have double accounting and carbon um, offsetting. So this is where kind of the advantages of, of blockchain technology of the unalterability um, really um, can, can, can make a difference. So for example, on the carbon offsetting, we have not solve this problem. This is Article 6 of the, of the Paris Agreement. Um, how do we do car global carbon offsetting? How can we get, get private um, markets and private investors actually involved? So like, we have uh, massive amounts of uh, carbon sinks that we can use, that we can activate. How can we monetize them without double counting? And there, again, um, of course, blockchain technologies um, can, uh, can play an important, important role. Yeah, so I mean, the immutability of blockchain, you know, the, the provenance, particularly supply and logistics that is transparent when you're talking about a kind of um, global infrastructure and information highway and, and legal framework as we as we discussed earlier makes total sense um, and and also how you describe that fitting into aspects of the green economy I think that now makes makes sense to a lot of people listening certainly made sense to me and it sounds really exciting I think the bit where people get well, you know, this this is this is technical. This this is this is a this is a jump above that is the financial element, the financial instruments, um, and I think it's 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 a difficult conversation. But I think we're going to kind of muddle through it if you don't mind. Um, so I'm I'm reading about that's what the, that's, the what, that's what Charles comes in. <laughs> he's, he's, <laughs> Great. He's, he's, okay, <laughs> Charles. Let, 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 let's have <laughs> let's have a bash at this then because. I'm reading here about the role of central banks, and I've also got, got some background on uh, Professor Wang Yao, director at the International Institute of Green Finance, who recently commented on the Green Central Banking Scorecard, which aims to assess central banks' performance. And she noted that central banks are not incorporating climate change-related risks or policy frameworks, that um, climate change is possibly a threat to financial stability, I think we've referenced that early. And, and also um, talking about supporting development of green finance, including new monetary and financial policies. Now, I think we've talked about the blockchain, we've, we've talked about all of this, but you've got this, this idea of a new financial ecosystem. How does that fit into all of that? What is the role of central banks? What is the role of um, China's um, you know, growing market share in crypto. How does this all fit together? Because it is confusing. All right, I, I will. I will take the question, Charles. Uh, I, I will start with that. Um, so there's some interesting developments over the last uh, years um, in, in the role of the central bank. So what what is the role of a central bank? It's actually quite simple. The role of the central bank is uh, the stability of a of money. Um, so we don't have high inflation uh, or we don't have deflation. So the stability of money um, in a system. And so what they're kind of have been looking at is kind of the uh, monetary flows. How much money do we actually have in the system? How is the import export um, to um, also have the currency risk? So that's all kind of part of the central bank. And what really drove uh, the uh, kind of recognition that climate change and um, broader ecological crisis have a impact on monetary stability was actually uh, Mark Carney and also in many ways PBOC, the People's Bank of China, um, in 2015, when they started to, to um, do more research on what is actually the climate risk on the financial system. Um, mm -hmm. And so the Mark Carney together with uh, Michael Bloomberg then set up the task force for climate related financial disclosure that looked at different types of risk that um, kind of come from the micro levels so or from the financial sector, then all the way to the macro level for the overall macro potential um, stability. Um, and I mentioned some of those before, it's um, separated into the uh, um, physical risk and, uh, and transition risk. The physical risks, um, um, if you have droughts and storms and suddenly you don't have uh, food security anymore because the harvests um, are, mm. are not there. The energy system is not working anymore because you don't have, as I said before, the hydropower plants because there's no um, good enough water flow. Um, and then you have transition risks, which are much more on the regulatory side um, or on the technology side or also on the market behavior side so that consumers don't want um, any of the dirty products anymore. And so kind of 
all this together, if kind of a lot of the companies are going bankrupt, so energy companies are not making enough money, fossil fuel dependent companies are not making enough money. What is happening with all the assets on the balance sheet of the banks? They have to write them down. If you have a huge write down of assets, that of course trickles them down to the whole economy. And that's when the macroeconomic stability for the whole economy um, is in question. And the changes in climate change are happening so fast that this is not something that you can slowly adapt to. This is happening really faster than anybody of us um, expected. And so a number of central banks from the, um, the uh, Bank, of, Bank of England, um, under Mark Carney that started it, the People's Bank of China, where Ma Jun here also in, in China um, played a, a massive role in integrating some of these, these considerations um, is integrating that. The European Central Bank is integrating that. Even now in the, uh, the Fed, the American Central Bank um, is talking about the climate risk for the monetary stability and really, really um, force uh, the financial institutions to do um, stress testing for, for climate. So before we did stress testing, um, if you remember um, after the dot com bust, um, uh, that we have to do more stress testing. What is the, the, the value of our portfolio if we have to write down stuff? Now it's really about climate stress testing and that this is becoming integrated an essential part um, of the duty of financial institutions mandated by uh, the central banks. Also the PBOC, the Chinese central bank just announced that actually last week that they will integrate that much more strictly into the management um, of the banks. So that's an absolute shift in mindset that we have seen um, over the last five years. Okay. However, um, however, we are not there yet. We are kind of that. What Wang Yao, um, who's who's my 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 dear boss, said, we are not there yet. Kind of, we are just at the beginning to really wrap our head around um, the system. So there's a, um, a network which is called the Network for Greening the Financial System (NGFS) that is a con conglomerate of the relevant central banks that tries to understand how do we actually evaluate this climate risk. How do we possibly also include broader risks like the uh, loss of biodiversity into our um, risk models that we have to do. Yeah, I mean, there's some great case studies in the Middle East, again, on food security caused by um, climate change and, and how that can lead to, to very immediate um, political consequences. But Charles, do you want to jump in on that and, and yeah. talk a little bit yeah, more about some of how these new instruments are looking at well, these problems? Yeah, with respect to the, 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 the CBDC in particular, right? Um, I think really it's about a, a very holistic definition of sustainability, right? Mm -hmm. And that includes what, what Christoph mentioned and all the bits on, on climate risk and catastrophe avoidance and, um, and stress testing in this regard. But I would also say, I shouldn't say, I, I shouldn't say, but in addition to that, I would say um, that really the CBDC is also so much about um, improving the overall operational efficiency of the entire economy. And mm. in so much as that reflects itself in, a, in additional sustainability, that of course then generates additional cushion for stress testing. It, 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 it addresses additional issues um, which relate to systematic risk and systemic risk, I guess is now a hot word um, uh, to use. So, so, I mean, it's just a few examples, right? So, I mean, uh, one thing that, that Christoph mentioned, I think this transition is incredibly important. Right. Okay, the ability, because you know, you're not gonna get from the zero to 100 immediately, right? Mm -hmm. And as China now is, let's just use power as an example, you know, transitions away from coal, which ironically was in its earliest versions of its green initiative were relatively green uses of coal, which, you know, I think makes some people laugh, but, you know, it's that transition, right? How do we um, sort of step by step, right? Incrementally move in the right direction. And one of the things that CBDC does and has already been shown to do here in China is it allows you to do directed subsidy and directed financing so much better um, than with cash, right? So you look at the counter example, let's just look at, you know, uh, COVID relief. Right, so if you look at the United States, you see just a, a an avalanche of mistakes. Right, the you know I remember reading you know the Los Angeles Lakers getting a relief check um, that was for, for small from the Small Business Administration. You know, and you hear about you know you you have to be a member of a certain set of banks in order to get uh, you know the loan, and you know checks getting lost and checks ending up at 
tax service providers rather than at the individual themselves and so on and so forth. Um, and, and that's just a paper system and that's how the paper system works. It has to matriculate its way sort of one step at a time. Um, you know, whereas the CBDC allows you to direct to um, individual wallets, it allows you to uh, connect with, uh, you know, a whole new level of, of financial inclusion. Um, and of course, not just in terms of QE, but in terms of financing, bank accounts, small business loans, um, and so on and so forth. So I, I think number one is that it's the ability to do sort of target linked, if you will, um, financing on a, in a massive, um, almost into the individual level scale. Number two, I think it then, it then enables a system of ultra high liquidity and of ultra high efficiency. So you mentioned a number before, which actually is part of a, a report that we put out just this last month with regard to um, third party payment, right? And as you said, mobile payments about 17%. Um, of GDP here, but outside of mobile, all of all of online payments now more than double that, right? So uh, wow, it's interesting. A very, very case. Right. And importantly, if you look at it, you know, mobile payments are directly linked to online commerce, which last year, even during COVID, grew, depending on who you ask, let's say 20% um, in China versus, a, of course, a negative number for offline commerce, right? So um, if, you, if you put those two things together, you'll see that the virtual payment or the third party online payment becoming ever more important um, as the entire market changes, the economy changes and how people are now shopping and, and, and so forth. Um, and, and then the, the CBDC then becomes even that much more important, right? As it links in with guys like Alipay and WeChat Pay. And, and don't forget, right, there's still union pay. <laughs> Right, which is now linked directly to um, you know the, the the main banks here in China, and when you put all those things together, now you're talking about an ultra liquid, ultra fast moving, ultra low cost, ultra efficient way to move money around, not just within China. Right now you're talking about cross border, mm. um, and wow. as talk you know earlier about now in terms of project financing not just consumption right so i think mm. when we think about the cbdc it, it is appropriate to also I, I think to to think more in terms of um not in addition to the green aspect but also the additional sustainability aspects of it which then enable all of the other positive benefits yeah i think i mean it's it's such a complicated but interesting discussion because you have the points on efficiency and the points on scalability and, and, and trust um, and why new instruments are needed. But also beyond that, you also kind of have this, this new global consciousness or conversation um, about dissatisfaction with existing systems. You know, my generation and in particular the younger generation grew up during a financial crisis in the West. Um, we, we've increasingly grown up um, not so much in the developed, but particularly in parts of the developing world, seeing climate change causing issues and perhaps caring about it and seeing it, seeing it as a real world problem more than the generation before. And I had a, a call, a, a very strange call in Christmas, at Christmas, where we had some Shanghai based crypto entrepreneurs and some quite high level American blockchain uh, developers who, who, you know, they'd worked and, and, and pitched to, to Tim Berners-Lee and others, and, and then some, some Middle East entrepreneurs on the call. And it, it was such an interesting call because in a way they all kind of had similar values. And, and obviously there were, there were some other things in the background, but the, the sophistication of the Shanghai based team in, in, in particular in this technology, there was, there was a point at which my American friends just sat back and, and kind of said, well, you know, we, we'd love to learn from you. Which <laughs> was just, and, it, you know, it was a really interesting kind of di discussion. And, 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 you know, of course, there were, there were also philosophical um, differences in terms of the technology. So in America, you kind of had the libertarian blockchain community, you know, freedom on the internet. Um, but then you also have the, the guys who want to create new financial instruments, new financial structures. And then in China, 
you have you have very advanced technologies, but but some different philosophies behind it as well. But but I guess the point is how these new systems are being layered connects into so many things like development, like climate change, um, like sustainable finance in the future. Um, so I think you know just just to end, we've got about five minutes, but I, I just want to keep going in to some of these technical aspects on the fintech level as much as possible, so everyone understands it as much as possible. Um, I have a quotation here of a guy called Bernice Lee from the Hoffman Center for Sustainable Resource Economy has suggested that China could pioneer new solutions by taking using the strength of, of state-owned enterprise, which, which, which again, you know, is, is something that in a way is particular to China uh, when compared with America, and proposing the idea of making 20% of public sector pay in the form of tokens redeemable through nature-based economy purchases. So one of the reasons I brought that up, one is, is to give a sense of, of how quickly ideas are shaping um, in China, particularly as, as um, Dr. Christoph mentioned in, in terms of you know, the, the rate at which crypto is growing, but also um, you know, how realistic are some of these solutions? How far away are they? The idea of, of investing or being paid in tokens. Well, I can I can you I can give you just a, a couple of very very micro examples, but I think it is happening. So you may know that you know the CBDC was rolled out last year, and one of the test cities is uh, Suzhou. Okay, mm -hmm. and Suzhou's uh, test product, if you will, the area in which it was asked to test um, this was in transport. Okay. So one project, again, that we've been engaged with um, does on a very micro level, it's certainly not 20% of, of, of pay, but on the very micro level is um, that if you have a parking lot, okay, so, so this is a very uh, sort of common way to buy land, right? It's a super low cost way to, to buy land and make use of it. But if you are able um, to track, and this is where the blockchain comes in, you have to prove Okay, that on a, I forget what it is, monthly or, or however, weekly basis or what have you, that, the, that you have installed um, and make use of X number, X percentage of charging stations. Okay, then you get a certain part of your licensing fee and taxation waived. Furthermore, okay, furthermore, the people wow. who use these stations, okay, and again, they have to swipe a thing and it goes to the digital wallet. They get that money replaced to them if they can show that they have been in fact parking in a, a partnered uh, garage and they were in fact parked in a charging station and charging and they were paying for it and so forth. So you can imagine this is a lot of information that's got to get traded now. Right, right. So right. the yeah. car has to actually be parked in that garage and has to be charging their car Mm. Right. That, of course, is easy to keep on a ledger, but then that then needs to be reported simultaneously with the garage itself. Right. Uh, in this case, to the blockchain. And everyone is then awarded in through the issuance, in this case, of CBDC or or a basically a coupon in the form of CBDC, if you will. OK, so, of course, that's a very small example. That's nowhere close to no, that, that makes total sense. Yeah. Um, but we're already seeing things like um, cities moving to pay right. their public employees only through um, digital currency. And that makes it possible for you to do these sort of uh, these sort of programs. Wow. So the cities, in, I mean, so in Dubai, there, there are case studies and, and in the States as well, people looking at, you know, connecting IoT into smart apps, into decentralized ledgers. And then possibly laying crypto payments in on top of that, um, but if people, I've, I haven't heard any case studies of being people actually being paid in tokens. Mm -hmm. Is is that something that's coming in China? Well, in this case, what I, in this case it was basically coupons laced on CBDC. Right. So, okay. so not in a true yeah. sort of uh, right. token. Right. So that makes sense. Is there just for information, not not for the issuance. Yeah. Of okay. Interesting. Well, look, I guess to round round things off today. Um, I thought I'd, I'd, we, we, we could finish this with some quick stats, but since 1990, China has grown its GDP by 40 times. 
uh, GDP per capita by 32 times, according to the World Bank. Its emissions have grown um, between 1990 to 2020. China increased its emissions from 2.4 billion tons to over 10 billion tons, making it a country with the largest absolute greenhouse emissions, surpassing the EU in regard to per capita emissions in 2016, despite a GDP per capita of about 40% of the EU. Um, now, you know, there's a lot of media out there on competition with China, but some of the things we've discussed today in terms of, of green finance and, 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 and fintech would also suggest that um, collaboration, technological and policy collaboration with China could also be um, a way to, to offset some of these other tensions. Um, what do you think are are the opportunities for you know, global society and international stakeholders to learn from some of the case studies um, rather than being threatened by them that, it, that are taking place in, in you know, universities and cities in China? I think kind of that's uh, one of the big areas of cooperation and in the world that is of course right now um, going into a number of different uh, conflicts, particularly um, over a number of issues uh, with China between the West uh, and, and uh, several Western countries and China. One of the areas where we continue to see very strong cooperation and cooperation interest from all sides is actually green finance. So developing mm -hmm. common standards on green finance was just announced again today um, by the uh, uh, People's Bank of China that they want to do that with the European Union, that they want to finish a common a harmonized green finance framework. The G20 was uh, the G20 working group on green finance was reactivated um, about a month ago with the co-lead of the US and China. So this is kind of the green finance is kind of the minimum cooperation mechanism, which seems not to be so competitive because we all agree financial flows are important. Financial flows keep wow. our, us fed and keep us uh, keep our economies somehow churning as, as much as we, we like, and we need to do green. So I think there is kind of this common understanding that this is a global good, no matter kind of on the technological competitions that we have, on the information control um, that we have that uh, comes with some of the digitalization um, aspects, kind of the concept of green finance um, is really something that brings um, together and still to today really, um, China and the world and is, is a platform for cooperation. On many of the other things, I think uh, there's, there's more competition, which can be good because of course competition also can lead to, to innovation and ideally the best product may win and not necessarily only the product that is coming from the largest market. Um, but of course, uh, um, kind of for, from a corporation point of view, I really am happy to see that green finance has such a strong following and a strong corporation potentially internationally. So I'll, Christoph I'll, and Charles. I'll, yeah, I'll just please. Add very quickly, I think what an what an amazing opportunity. I mean, just looking at us here, right? Um, to to do to cooperate in meaningful ways uh, for the betterment of of the entire planet, right? I think you know, as China announced, um, you know, trying to to make sure it gets to its its carbon peak by twenty thirty, you know, rather than you know commenting on whether that's possible or not, I think let's all try to get it there, right? Let's all try to get it there, and what an incredible accomplishment for. For China, but for mankind, uh, should China be able to do that? Further, I'll say also that when it comes to the green finance, I think people can view China as a giant sandbox in the sense that um, with the support of the relevant authorities uh, in Beijing, I think China is able to give you a kind of a sandbox and lubricate and facilitate innovation in a way that may be difficult mm -hmm. um, right. in other countries to do. And it's able to do the thing that China's always done. And yeah. that is, again, multiply your product by 1.5 billion. And, and you know, when you launch something in China, you may get to that critical point faster. And then you can go and you can do it, mm. you know, worldwide. So I think it would be great if people thought of China as a green finance sandbox where they can, you know, really blow up their, their, their concept and get right. it to that break even quickly mm. and then be able to roll that out in a global. I mean, that's why I asked you about universities earlier, because, you know, the, the issue with that sometimes is access, right? Because I heard you talk, I think, on, on a previous interview about that sandbox technique and the role of state-owned enterprise in, 
in really incubating a lot of the payment infrastructure that's scaled so quickly in China today. It's a really interesting case study, particularly for me as someone who's studying how governance and technology are combined and how you know, a lot of the governments using innovation tools and using technology can often, can often pu push through change um, slightly quicker than just taking a traditional policy approach. And I think that state enterprise aspect to China is both captivating, but also a real challenge for countries where the innovation is pushed out from the private sector. And I think, you know, that, that might be a really interesting discussion uh, for another time, because obviously with, with green finance and climate change, you, you have to have government involved and, and state enterprise involved as well as the private sector, as, as well as individuals. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating subject. Um, I think we, we could have spent a lot more time going into some of the details, but um, Christoph and Charles, thank you so much for your time today.